Can you see my screen as well? Yes, we can see. Yes. It. So I will talk about something uh, very different. I'll talk about uh, machine learning for forecasting uh, salmon prices. And uh, to me, that sounds, having seen you uh, talk about uh, autonomous driving, this sounds very simple. It's just a two dimensional problem, not three dimensional. So it should be a lot simpler to, uh, to solve. Um, a bit of my background, I have a PhD in mathematics from NTNU. I worked with uh, pattern recognition in images. That's some years ago. And uh, after that, I've been working in the oil industry and then last two years uh, with MariTech in, in the seafood industry. And I had the data science department in MariTech. And we we're talking about forecasting salmon prices, um, which is an important price for Norway and for the, the players in the seafood sector. Understanding the development of the price is very important for planning how you slaughter your fish, when you want to sell the fish to the market, which markets you want to sell to and so forth. So for both the, uh, the traders, for the distributors, for the retailers and for the producers, knowing the salmon price is very important for planning um, how you act in the market. But even if it is important, it's surprisingly little work done on forecasting. Um, there are some studies, but not a lot of, of really thorough work on that. So it's so far, it's, it's mainly based on gut feeling and experience when they plan um, or for, try to forecast the prices themselves. A few words about Maritech as well. Um, we are a software company um, that is working towards the seafood industry. We are the, the, one of the leading software companies uh, in the world uh, working with seafood. We are mainly creating software for um, trading and distribution of fish. And in Norway, around 70% of the fish traded out of Norway is traded to our systems. Um, and we have around 100 employees, um, been growing very fast uh, last years. And we also have a data science department that is working on using machine learning and other analysis techniques for helping our customers in um, automating a lot of the choices they do in the market. We are located in Molde, that's our head office, and then we have offices uh, a lot of different places in Trondheim uh, and, uh, and uh, mainly then in North America, Chile, Iceland, and different places in Norway. Before I start on the price forecasting, I'll just give a brief glimpse of some of the problems that we, our, our customers face in, in the seafood sector. And that's related to both forecasting and supply and to optimizing uh, distribution of fish and price forecasting. And the number one and maybe most important challenge in the seafood or aquaculture industry is biomass forecasting. So biomass, that's the weight of the fish that is in the sea. And of course, that's kind of the whole, the value of your company. If you are a, a fish farmer, that's in the fish in the sea. And it is surprisingly difficult to know how much fish you have uh, in the sea. It's not like you have a, chi a chicken farm or a cow farm where you can count and weigh the animals. Um, here you have to re rely on cameras and all, we already see that that's hard to use cameras to, uh, to count and, and measure sizes of uh, fish. And you have thousands of thousands of fish in a pan and it's hard to give, get an accurate estimate of the of the, the combined weight and also the size distribution of the fish there. You can also use feed uh, consumption as a measure of, uh, of growth. But still, with all these techniques, it's up to 25% error in forecasting of the biomass. And that has big consequences because you typically sell the fish before you slaughter it. So you have already sold the fish. Then you take it up and slaughter it and it's 
maybe less fish than you thought, or it's a different size, different quality than you have thought, and then you've already have sold. So you have to start dealing with your customers, selling them something else than they, that they have bought. So kind of reducing that variance, um, having better estimates and forecasts of, uh, of the fish in the sea, that's very important for, for, the, um, for the industry. And there's a lot of work being done there, both on cameras, um we do it in a bit different way we just use uh, mathematical methods uh, to see if there are systematic skewnesses in the forecast that they give uh, with the actual um, fish that they take out and see if that can be related to weather for instance uh, other parameters in the growth rate and see if we can correct for those skewnesses in future forecasts so that's one example. Um, another very important challenge in the industry is uh, distribution. So typically fish is uh, it's farmed in many different locations in Norway and it's sold to hundreds and hundreds of customers uh, throughout the world. Um, and a typical customer buys very small amounts of fish and they are very specific on, on what kind of fish they want. They want a specific weight class and they want a specific quality. So the challenge is to match what you have uh, with all the, uh, the bidders and then optimize how you distribute the fish to get the most value out of the fish and also to minimize the uh, logistical um, effort with uh, bringing the fish to the market. And also you have to keep in mind that the fish is usually uh, flown out fresh, so it has to be this has to be done very quickly to, for the fish to arrive at the customers while the seal is fresh. So to illustrate the example, this is, if you have a supplier in Norway, um, it has a forecast. It's, it's going to, to sell fish at these weight classes. And this is the price that they want for the fish based on weight class. So it's a higher price they want for six to seven kilo than for four to five kilo, which is the most common. Uh, weight class. And then you have buyers throughout the world, like here in Rome, you have a buyer that wants five to six uh, kilos and six to seven. And this is the price that that buyer is willing to pay for the fish. And then you have similar buyers in, let's say, Tel Aviv or Seoul. And then the challenge is to, to match uh, what you have here with the buyers in a way that optimizes the value of fish. And that's a project we have ongoing with, um, with Mødeforskning and the University of College in Molde to, to find algorithms for optimizing this problem uh, and automating this process. Because now it's done manually, typically, and, and the traders use their experience and they use Excel spreadsheets to try to get this done in an opt optimized way. And we think it's a lot of uh, uh, to gain by um, automating uh, this through machine learning or other types of algorithms. Then the final kind of problem uh, is price forecasting. And this is a project that we are ongoing now with Sintef and with Seaborn, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, seafood traders in Norway, uh, located in Bergen. And I guess, as you know, that forecasting prices that is, is very hard forecasting, anything is, is hard. Um, and uh, that's why maybe it's, it hasn't been done a lot of attempts on forecasting salmon price. Uh, these are a couple of examples that show so, some of the challenges and pitfalls with forecasting. This is um, interest rate from um, uh, Norges Bank, or Norwegian Bank. So the red line is the actual interest rate and the blue lines are the forecasted rates at the given points. And as you can see, um, uh, the model here is, is trending toward uh, a, a fixed point and, and, uh, and the forecasts are not very precise uh, looking back in history. So even Norges Bank, which is a fairly advanced um, model builder and that's probably one of the best um, 
uh, teams on, on uh, this kind of forecasting are missing the target uh, quite a lot. This is another example. This is um, from The Economist, which is also very uh, uh, well uh, re re respected uh, newspaper. They have forecasted um, the outcome of the presidential election in, um, in the United States. And the day before election, they forecasted the 97% winning chance over Joe Biden. And we know now, now that that is turned out to be correct. But I'm not sure if the 97% um, uh, probability um, in, in hindsight uh, is something that they are proud of. It's, I, I think the, uh, the real uncertainty there was a lot higher than, than their models showed. So that's some examples of the difficulties with, uh, with forecasting. If I skip this one, yeah, well, just very briefly, why does it make sense to forecast the price? Obviously, if you have a fish farm, and if you don't know anything about the farm uh, or the price, sorry, you will typically select to slaughter an even amount of fish every week uh, and then sell the fish. Then you get a kind of even uh, workload for your people. But obviously, if you know that the price is going up in the three weeks, you will plan your slaughter differently and try to, to postpone as much as possible and slaughter it toward the end of the period so that you make more money on your fish. That's kind of simple and obvious. And uh, if you kind of, if you hit on this 60% of the time uh, or 70% of the time at least, you can predict the direction of the price correctly. Um, a medium-sized fish farmer can easily make uh, many millions a year extra by uh, by planning uh, structure according to the forecasted price. So that's kind of some of the uh, the business case uh, behind forecasting. And you have a lot of other um, long-term um, business cases as well. So, what are the parameters affecting the salmon price? So on the supply side, it's fairly easy. You have the biomass, which is the amount of fish in the sea. You have the processing capacity, so how much fish can you slaughter at a given day and bring the uh, bring into the market. You have regulations that tells you how much fish you can actually have uh, in the sea in a specific locations. You have diseases and parasites, as you know, uh, that will infect, affect the mortality of the fish. So how much of the fish that you put out in the pan will actually live to be slaughtered. And then you have the weather that affects the, the growing weight of the fish. So warm water, um, then the fish will grow faster than in cold water. So that's the supply side. And then on the demand side, um, you have more like seasonal trends. So uh, the demand for uh, salmon is higher around Christmas and Easter and in and, and summer as well. You have the purchasing power in uh, the market, you have consumer taste and trends, exchange rates between uh, Euro and Norwegian Kroner, uh, and you have prices of, of alternative food sources like meat and chicken and, and vegetables. And of course, you also have things like global pandemics that certainly affects the price a lot and is obviously very hard to, to model. And generally, it's kind of the supply side, it's, it's possible to model. You have physical models for the growth, you have physical models for the weather, you can observe a lot of the things there. So it's that part of the equation is easy to, or not easy, but it's possible to, to model and forecast. Whereas the demand side, um, it's a lot harder to, to model, especially like consumer behavior, consumer trends, uh, and, um, and shocks in the market like uh, COVID-19. It's almost impossible to, uh, to make meaningful models of. So therefore, it's, it's easier to, uh, to focus on the supply side when, when doing modeling. As for the, for the data sources for prices, um, there are just a few uh, public data sources for, uh, for salmon prices. 
uh, there's something called the Nasdaq Salmon Index, which is a weekly price collected from um, Norwegian uh, traders. And then you have the fish pool forward prices, which are future prices uh, in the market. And you have export volumes from, um, from SSB or from other, uh, from US and UK and Chile that gives you some indication of supply uh, available to the market. So that's the kind of the only data that you have publicly to forecast the price. But then we in MyTech, we have a, an advantage because we handle uh, all the sales and purchase transactions for most of the players in the Norwegian market. So we have a lot of detailed information on, on daily sales and purchase transactions. And we think, think that by using that data, we are able to predict uh, price uh, trends faster than if you just use the public data, which is on a weekly basis. So that's why we are doing in this project is to use the daily sales and the daily purchase transactions together with the Nasdaq data to see if we can achieve it uh, better predictions um, on the short and medium term for, for the price. But there are still a lot of challenges with this. Um, one thing is that obviously the data is in different kind of uh, time span, so you have to transfer it to, to weekly or daily data um, from one or the other. Um, you have to deal with the seasonality trends, um, which is surprisingly hard for, for the weekly data, since, for instance, Christmas doesn't, it's not on the same week every year. So uh, if you have weekly data, kind of capturing that seasonality is, is a bit challenging. Also, Easter is it's a different weeks every year, so uh, you have to do some uh, some tricks to to affect for that. Um, and then for the sales and purchases, um, there are also some challenges that I will I will get back to. And this is the forward price. Uh, that's on monthly basis, so that's even another uh, time scale that we have to factor in if we are to use that uh, that kind of data. And these are the daily prices from um, one of our customers. So these are daily sales prices uh, to the right and purchase prices to the left uh, for different weight classes uh, of fish. And there's a lot more detail in these data than in, uh, in the uh, Nasdaq data. And that's where the, uh, the interesting from information is, we believe. You can also see it's a lot of noise in the data. Um, and that's also the challenge here to, to make uh, sense out of this data. Another challenge is that typically purchases are done to be sold uh, next week. So you have to factor in that the kind of the price assumption for a purchase is different than for a sale. So you have to, to find out what's the time um, if you do a purchase today, um, what sales price are you looking at then? Is that the sales price next week or in five days um, that you are actually trying to capture uh, in today's purchase price? So you have to kind of um, find the right uh, lag between purchases and sales uh, to make meaning out of that data as well. And that's typically what we see here in a project like this, that, uh, and I guess that's for all machine learning projects, is that a lot of the work is just in cleaning the data, um, making the data um, in a state that it uh, can give us meaningful predictions. So um, it's easy to kind of talk about the methods and, uh, and the AI, but just getting the data in cleaning out uh, the data, taking out um, sales and purchases that are not relevant for, for the spot price. That's a lot of job uh, to do that in the right way to make sure that you capture uh, the right prices. Yeah, I see I'm starting to run out of time. Um, so obviously for forecasting time series, um, 
one simple method is just a name method. You surprise tomorrow, it's the same as surprise today. And that's a surprisingly um, good method. It's hard to beat that method. Um, and then you have regression models, obviously, and uh, more machine learning type uh, neural networks. Um, um, yeah. And of course, you have the futures as well from, from Fishbowl. And we have looked at different methods. This is just a quick review of things that we have tried. Uh, we tried the uh, profit from Facebook and various other methods. And the blue line here is actual price. And the green line here is uh, long short term memory and model, which is the type of model we think is the best for forecasting prices. It's also been used for stock prices, for instance. So it's a it's a type of method that seems to work well for, for time series. And I'm sure that most of you know this better than me. Um, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Um, long short term memory method as a, as a kind of a neural network method that tries to capture um, history in a better way than uh, ordinary neural network. So it's gonna keep important learning uh, from kind of far behind in the time series to make sure that you capture uh, or keep important uh, data going forward in the future. And, and the kind of obviously the, the problem with that is that um, it is flexible method, it can capture uh, long term effects. And uh, the drawbacks is that it is, there are a lot of parameters to tune, it's a difficult model to fit maybe, and it also is time consuming to, to run. And also, as you also might know that um, LCM models is used a lot, uh, especially in speech uh, recognition. So typically for long sentences, um, like uh, this one, she grew up in Norway. Now she has been in China for a few months only. She speaks fluent, dot, dot, dot. Um, that's a kind of a, a problem where you need to have a more of a long-term memory to be able to predict what should be uh, the next word in that sentence. And LCMs are being used a lot in, in kind of things that we are familiar with, like in Google Translate, um, Alexa, uh, Siri, and uh, Facebook uh, uses a lot of LCM transactions every day in their algorithms. So we have been starting to work on that for price forecasting. This is just kind of one day prediction uh, with a model, um, a univariate model where we only predict based on, on the data itself. Obviously a one day prediction, it's not too hard. So this is uh, an okay fit of the model. Um, but ideally we would like to use uh, multivariate models where you input both the purchase date, uh, data and the sales data and NASDAQ data and maybe other sources as well to predict the price because we think both the purchase data and the sales data has separate information that can affect the price. But we see that kind of multivariate models is a lot harder to, to make uh, work well. So we're not finished with uh, find, kind of finding a good way in doing that. So that's kind of the work that is being done now uh, together with Cynthia. Um, yeah, we see that kind of data cleaning and model fitting, it's, it's much more complicated with, uh, with the multivariate models. This is some kind of uh, brief examples of what we've done so far. This is based on a student project on this summer. So we haven't, um, we haven't any data from the, 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 the SIMTEF study so far, but this is a 14 day prediction of the price based on this history. And the light blue is the kind of the actual price um, for that period. So it's not, it doesn't, seem too bad in this case. And also here you have on the right a 14 week prediction. Here you see the model is maybe kind of fitting, overfitting a bit, but still here as well, um, it looks uh, promising in this example at least. So I think it's, it is possible to make meaningful predictions um, on the short to medium term using um, an LSTM model. Yeah. And to summarize, um, from what we see, it's kind of it's difficult to to beat a naive 
uh, or the naive seasonal forecasting for very short-term forecasts, like one week. But still, it, it seems like LCM models are promising for, for uh, shorter-term forecasts, like let's say two weeks to four weeks. And it seems that it's possible to achieve hit rates at at least 60%, um, which indicates that it's possible to make money on, on forecasts like this. Um, some of the challenges that we need to work more on is to, to fully utilize the information that we have in the, in the detailed price transaction data. We also have some challenges with um, unpredictable supply side shocks effects. Typically, if you get uh, um, lice in a certain location, they have to slaughter everything uh, at once, um, which is unplanned. And then that would, could affect the price uh, that week because you get a lot of uh, extra supply in the market. And the question is, can we use weather data uh, and public fish health data to predict those kind of shocks as well? And can we use that uh, data in the model to, to try to factor in um, those supply shocks? So that was all I had. Thank you. Thank you, Odvar. Uh, we have gotten some questions here for you. Um, and the first question is, uh, have you looked into graph neural networks for forecasting? No, we have not. But uh, that's a good tip, thanks. Hmm. Yes. Um, another question is, have you noticed a specific trend regarding which par parameter has the biggest impact on the biomass forecasting? Um, yeah, I think uh, like obviously like feed uh, usage, that's the kind of most, uh, that's the strongest parameter you have. Uh, depending a bit of, of the camera resolution, if you have a good camera resolution, that's, that is valuable data. But um, take, uh, apart from that, just the feed consumption is, is the most important. Thank you. And, uh... A uh, last question here is uh, for students who want to work in MarTech. Do you currently have any positions out? Um, we don't have anything out, but we are definitely interested in anyone that are um, uh, have good skills. So it's just uh, possible to contact us, definitely. Nice. Thank you. So now I will um, share screen. Yes, so that was uh, that was it for us um, for this talk. Um, let's see. Um, this was also, this was our last event for this semester, and um, we want to thank uh, Odvar, uh, Rudolf, and Stephanie for um, presenting. And uh, also, we would uh, we'd like to thank um, thank you for watching. Um, I hope you will follow us uh, for the next uh, semester as well. We have uh, plans for uh, some exciting uh, events. So uh, if you follow us on Facebook and Instagram, you will uh, you will get notified when uh, these events are uh, are out. Um, and also, I would like to remind you to um, to answer the quiz to have a chance to win some nice prizes. And again, thanks for watching. We will see you next semester. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.